Hello, and welcome to Cats Week. I'm Annalise Poorman. Monroe County Health Administrator Penny Cottle talked about being cautious despite lifting local COVID-19 restrictions. At the May 21st coronavirus press conference, she said residents should be wary of businesses who are reopening too quickly. As patrons, we will have to decide, are we comfortable going in to a facility, whether it's retail, food, whether it's just a retail shop, who is acting like this is 2019? Or are they easing back into how they're setting up? Do they still have their tables set six feet apart? While it may not be a mandate, it's still certainly a recommendation. It's a safety factor. So we would encourage people to continue to think about those things in that manner. Just because you can put people closer than six feet doesn't mean that you should put people closer than six feet. Assistant Vice President for Strategic Partnerships at Indiana University, Kirk White, also announced that students, faculty, and staff would be required to have their COVID-19 vaccination in order to return to IU for the fall semester. He said there would be an exemption process, but it would be tight. Now, we're going to have an exemption process, but I'm going to have to say that that's going to be a really tight exemption process. It will be for very limited uh, religious reasons or medical reasons. It'll be much more restrictive than our uh, flu vaccine exemptions that we had uh, last year. So this exemption process, uh, there'll be more details about that posted by uh, June the 15th. But just let me say that that uh, it's going to be a very restrictive exemption uh, uh, scenario so you should plan to uh, get vaccinated. White said that students who cannot provide proof of vaccination will have their registration canceled. He added that it will also become a condition of employment. At its May 24th meeting, the Ellettsville Town Council discussed using a water tank as a business sign. Town manager Mike Farmer presented a request to add a 220-square-foot banner to the Kihi water tank to help advertise their business. He said this would put Kihi over its allowed signage limit, but would like to make an exception because Kihi is the largest building in town. This is a very unique situation where the largest building in our town has the smallest road frontage, probably one of the smallest road frontages in town along the highway. So I ask if we could, you know, make a waiver for that. Council member Scott Oldham challenged the signage ordinance. He questioned planning director Kevin Talati whether this conversation would be happening if Kihi just painted on the water tank instead. So if they just paint the water tank, Kihi, that size, we really have nothing in it. If, as long as it doesn't have Kehi written on the tower, no. So if, if they painted, did, Ke, wait a minute, if they painted Kehi on the sign, or Kehi on a water tank, bigger than what the sign ordinance is, that would be in violation of the sign ordinance. I mean, the way our code's written, that would be considered signage. Again, my proof that we have erred with this ordinance. That's ridiculous. That's beyond ridiculous. Farmer suggested they waive the fee to take the signage request to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Council members chose not to do so. And we'll have more Cats Week after this message. For hurting families in Monroe County. A contribution to, to children who are vulnerable and in need of an advocate. A staff that goes above and beyond to support and advocate for children in need of services. Uh web of remarkable people who are dealing with difficult situations. So many young people that uh, are in need of help and trying to find a stable family, a stable place to live. Without uh, the CASAs to, to make that happen, many of them would be unable to find a good home. I love being that voice for the child who can't speak for themselves in court. It takes me out of my comfort zone <laughs> and it also helps others. CASA means supporting our community. Being a CASA is making sure that your village is healthy and whole and that the children in your village will someday be able to help the village as well. A child who doesn't have a voice, maybe in their family situation or a school situation, now has a voice that can advocate for them. 
I really enjoy working with children that are going through difficult times and letting them know that I care about their future. We are privileged with our charge of representing the best interest of children. And so therefore we can advocate for exactly what they need without restriction, focusing on their best interest. I want to repair the world one child at a time. Welcome back to Cats Week. The Bloomington Utilities Service Board honored the life of a former City of Bloomington Utilities employee at its May 24th meeting. Transmission and Distribution Director Brandon Prince presented a resolution to gift a fire hydrant to the family of CBU employee Mark Raper, who passed away May 15th. He talked about how CBU employees wanted to do something special in Raper's memory. So what we did is we took an old hydrant and after hours, we sandblasted it and, and put a fresh coat of paint on it. And then we gave everyone paint markers and we let them, uh, let them all sign it. Then uh, the, the hydrant traveled to uh, Mark's viewing uh, over on the east side of town. And it's, it spent four or five hours there. And once uh, we, we just thought we wanted to show support to the family and uh, show what Mark meant to everyone there at CBU. Assistant City Attorney Chris Wheeler recognized that the fire hydrant could be declared surplus and gifted to the family if it has no market value. Prince confirmed that to be true. Board members approved the resolution unanimously. The Bloomington Board of Public Works discussed two appeals for excessive growth at a home on East Round Hill Lane. At the May 25th meeting, Neighborhood Compliance Officer Joe Stong talked about issuing the notices. She said the yard had prohibited plants that were taller than the allowed height of eight inches and that the homeowner did not respond to the initial violation. I issued a notice of violation on April 30th. Um, the grass Turf grass was over eight inches tall. Uh, I issued a second violation on May the 10th. Um, the, the grass was still not in compliance and there were other weeds and things on the property that were out of compliance. I, I got no response and so I went ahead and marked it for abatement and it's before you now, we were asking for permission to enter the property to abate the violations. Petitioner Alex Goal said the original notice did not specify what prohibited plants are in his yard. He argued that according to municipal code, only specific plants are not allowed to be over eight inches. The document notice of violation that I got does not identify the class of prohibited plants which are alleged to be on my property. My reading of the ordinances is that only those named classes of plants are prohibited when the plants are more than eight inches. Board members rejected the appeal unanimously. They moved on to discuss abatement of the property. Assistant City Attorney Daniel Dixon questioned Stong over additional violations that would make abatement necessary. You mentioned Linda Thompson did a site visit yesterday, correct? Yes. Um, and you discussed uh, with her some of the violations that she observed? Correct. Um, you mentioned turf grass in excess of eight inches. Is that one of the violations she noted? She did, yes. Um, and then did she also identify some impermissible plants such as purple winter creeper and honeysuckle that were in excess of eight inches? She did, yes. And those things are in violation of the municipal code, correct? They are, yes. Stong recommended continuous abatement, which would allow city officials to clean up the property at the owner's expense for any future violations. Board members approved this unanimously. And we'll have more Cats Week after this message. I'm at risk of thinking there's just no point in trying. I'm at risk of looking in the mirror and hating what I see. I'm at risk of regretting what I do just to join the crowd. 
I'm at risk of being told not to tell. And you would never know it by looking at me. But with Girls Inc. in my corner, there for me every day. Believing in me. Showing me what's possible. I can be strong enough to respect myself and my body. To say I can rather than I can't. To say no with no apology. To be a leader. To finish school. To own my future. To break the cycle. Girls Inc. believes every girl can succeed. That's why the trained professionals of Girls Inc. are there for our girls every day, supporting, mentoring, and guiding them in a safe, girls-only environment, building bonds that last for years and change that lasts a lifetime. Girls Inc. gives girls the tools they need to boldly face challenges, to resist peer pressure, to be the first in their families to go to college, to beat the odds. With Girls Inc. in her corner, every girl can be healthy, confident, and resilient. She'll do more than dream about her potential. She'll reach it. With you in my corner. With you in my corner, I will not be another statistic. I will fight for myself. For my future. With you in my corner, I will win. Fuel her fire and she will change the world. Girls Inc. Inspiring all girls to be strong, smart, and bold. Welcome back to Cats Week. The Bloomington City Council discussed hybrid electronic and in-person meetings at its May 26th special session. Council Administrator Attorney Stephen Lucas presented a resolution that would allow members of the public and some council members to attend future meetings digitally. He stated that the city supports this resolution and recognized that some boards and commissions have already passed some form of the resolution. And Corporation Counsel Philippa Guthrie wanted me to uh, share that uh, the administration has reviewed the resolution, um, that they are fully supportive of it, and that they intend to make sure that other boards and commissions throughout the city um, have such a policy in place as soon as possible um, that, that aligns with this one as, as much as possible. Um, I know some boards, I believe the Utility Service Board may have even acted already to, to adopt a policy. Um, just as a point of information, Information. I know that the county um, uh, commissioners have also adopted a policy um, that uh, essentially looks, looks like the policy you have in front of you. Reporter Dave Askins asked why this was a resolution and not an ordinance. Council member Isabel Piedmont Smith echoed this concern. Lucas clarified that a resolution can be enforced in the same way as an ordinance in this case. Many of the city's policies are adopted via resolution. Um, certainly an ordinance would have been an option here. Uh, the guidance that came from AIM was uh, that cities adopt a resolution. Um, it's certainly not the intent to imply that uh, because this is a resolution, it's, it's any less enforceable or uh, any less binding than, than something that would have done by ordinance. Council members approved the resolution 7 to 0. The Bloomington City Council Housing Committee discussed changes to rental unit inspections in the Municipal Code. At the May 26th meeting, Director of Housing and Neighborhood Development John Zodi said the city has trouble enforcing occupancy limits in smaller rental units. He presented an ordinance that would require tenants and property owners to sign a document to prove a rental unit is meeting city occupancy limits. Having another piece of documentation in-house that uh, helps us document something to planning that uh, says, here's the affidavit, this, but this house is over-occupied. Here's the affidavit that attests that uh, it has this uh, number of, of uh, tenants in it. They have all signed it. The landlord's attested to that. The tenants have attested to that. Uh, I guess it provides more documentation if I, if I uh, understand your question correctly. Uh, and so that allows them us the ability to track uh, in a more data-driven way over occupancy when it comes up at this threshold of the four units 
or less per, per building. Council member Kate Rosenbarger asked about the size of rental units targeted by the ordinance. She wondered why HAND chose properties with four units or less rather than larger units. If we're worried about over-occupancy, I, I feel like targeting rental units of, of four units or less is missing a very wide piece of housing units in our city. I mean, we obviously we have multiple buildings with like five or more units and we're not requiring affidavits for those where like if there is a fire, that's a ton more people that we have to evacuate. Council member Matt Flaherty showed concern over how the ordinance is worded. He said it needs to be clear that the ordinance exists to enforce the UDO and not for safety purposes. We should be very clear that this ordinance is to help enforce that policy decision that has already been made and is not specifically about danger and about safety because that is something different, which is about um, number of bedrooms and occupancy of those bedrooms. Um, so I, I, I'd be interested in an amendment, frankly, to strike the second whereas clause um, or, or modify it in some way to be more clear about that um, because I think it's a it's it's a pretty minor point, but but the language and how we think about and talk about different types of uh, residents in our community uh, has very real implications in, in how we think about greater housing policy, and I think we've seen that recently. Council members voted to recommend the ordinance to the City Council 4-0. to zero. And we'll have more Cats Week after this message. Let's talk about sex. What is consent? And what's not? Consent is based on choice. Consent is active, not passive. Consent is giving permission without feeling pressure. What is not consent? Silence. Passed out. Intoxicated. Fear. Is it not, is not consent. consent. Got consent? Ask. Sex without consent is a crime. Only yes means yes. Welcome back to Cats Week. County planner Anne Cresselius presented an amendment to the Fieldstone PUD at the May 26 Monroe County Board of Commissioners meeting. She outlined proposed changes to the PUD, including updated design standards and additional proposed uses. The petitioner is requesting a planned unit outline amendment to include um, the following uses that are defined by Chapter 802. So um, they're wanting to add in three uses government facility community center and agricultural uses not animal related to the list of approved uses for parcel L. Um, with this request, they're also proposing to define uh, some design standards that were either silent or a little vague within the originally approved ordinance. Uh, the intent of this request is for the Van Buren Township Trustee's Office to be able to pursue the construction of a township office that would also be a community center and have a community garden. A resident of Fieldstone expressed concern that the center would be close to some families' backyards. Van Buren trustee Rita Barrow said that these concerns would be addressed when the township enters the design phase of the project. She says the goal of the project is to enhance, not disrupt what the community has. I am willing to work with the residents. I don't want to disturb anything that they currently have. What I'm wanting to do is enhance it. So, um, yes, we will be working close together with the residents before we ever put a shovel to the dirt. Commissioners unanimously approved the amendment. The Bloomington Historical Preservation Commission discussed renovating a shed at a property on West Allen Street. At the May 27th meeting, Assistant Director of Housing and Neighborhood Development Brent Pierce presented a request to restore a historic garden shed in the McDowell Local Historic District. He explained the shed meets the criteria presented by the local guidelines. It's preferable that outbuildings should be placed to the rear of the house where there is little visual access and, no, and there are no material restrictions for accessory structures within these guidelines. Petitioner Elizabeth Cox Ash explained the doors had begun to rot due to winter weather. She said this changed her original plan to do a simpler replacement. There's been some rot and the carriage doors are now detaching themselves from the original posts. 
And since we had our contractor out to look at it, two of the posts will need to be replaced anyway. So initially we were looking at replacing like we did in 1991, but the new restrictions with planning state it has to be so many feet away from the um, alley and so many feet away from the side and we will lose our entire backyard for this structure. So then we talked to our contractor again and decided, well, let's renovate what there is and do it again. Commissioners approved the renovation five to zero. And that is all for Cats Week. Thank you for joining us. For Cats and WFHB, I'm Annalise Poorman.